you doing? Welcome back to Radio Stock. I'm Ms. Anara Stock, and I'm getting you through the night. So you'll have to forgive me today, darling. I have a touch of some sort of virus in my throat, and I'm going to have to speak a little lower than usual. So if you're tuning in, you might want to put the volume up, or at least put on headphones. First things first, I'd like to say thank you very much to all my precious little pets and perverts that said happy birthday to me on the 3rd. Now, I know you had very short notice because usually I don't talk about my birthday very much, but yes, it is January 3rd, and only a few of you observe that. But I noticed who did, and believe me, I take care of you when you have manners. Now, tonight's topic, or today's, depending on where you are, I don't know. Anyway, the present topic (laughs) that I'm going to cover tonight is actually not erotic. Well, not that much, anyway. As you might have noticed from the cover art, this podcast is about FBI agents. In pop culture, so fictional FBI agents. Now, devoted Starketeers will notice that Mistress really, really, really likes Twin Peaks and the X-Files. I have erotic audios in this spooky vein, such as Haunting at Stark Manor, or Do Bad Things for Me. And of course, my most popular sellers are my numbers stations. So if you like things that are spooky, otherworldly, a little (laughs) X-Files-y... feel free to spin by my goodies store. Not every offering is like that, but I do do these on the regular. If you're familiar with Night Flirt, you know where to find my goodies. If you are not, if you are new, you're just finding out who I am, I want you to go to inarastark.com. That's I-N-A-R-A-S-T-A-R-K. Dot com. And you can look at all the different things I have available. I've got plenty of explanations of what goodies are, in my case usually erotic audio files, although sometimes I will make pick sets or wallpaper sets. And you can have a general sense of who I am and what I'm all about. It's 21 plus. Bear that in mind. Surf safely. So back to my notes here. And incidentally, I want to plug something real quick. I'm using Evernote right now. That's what I did the uh, outline for this episode in, and it is... They're not paying me for it. (laughs) I'd be much more ecstatic if I was being paid. But I just want to say it's a very fun little program. Yeah, it's very good. So if you do a lot of writing, if you're an academic, if you're a writer, researcher, what have you... Uh, If you're an academic, I don't know how the hell you afford me, but whatever. Um, Evernote. It has the really cute little elephant head logo. Okay, so back to my outline here. Back to the FBI agents. So like I said, devoted fans, they know my taste in television. So I started to think about it. I started to say, well, okay, Inara, why do you keep going back to Twin Peaks? Why do you keep going back to at least early X-Files? What is so fascinating about these characters? Because, let's face it, these shows, Twin Peaks and X-Files, I'm going to pick on my favorites. They were unusual. Twin Peaks especially. X-Files is far more closely related to the long American television tradition of the FBI agent. Twin Peaks, there's just no accounting for Twin Peaks. God bless it. And not all of this fascination is just hormones for the young Kyle MacLachlan or for Julian Anderson. I've realized that apparently I'm really, really interested in this figure. Not, I mean, of course, yes, these characters, but the figures they are. Think archetypes. Think symbols. Remember, remember how Mistress always looks for the essence of something. And this is not something that normally crops up in my personal or intellectual interests. Usually I'm about art, art history, literature. But you know what? I do watch a lot of cheesy television, 
and a lot of cheesy movies. And if I keep consuming a certain thing, there's got to be a reason for it. So, anyway, I have interesting things to say. You like the sound of my voice anyway, so let's relax and think some thoughts together. Now, I'm restricting my inquiry to the 1990s because, my God, that was a time, wasn't it? I really don't want to call it innocent, but pre-9-11 U.S. pop culture really was different. It was a very separate thing from U.S. pop culture as it is now. And furthermore, this is a podcast, not a miniseries. So what is it about these agents, these G-men and our one G-woman? Now, as an American, I am painfully aware of the various misadventures, to put it very, very euphemistically, the various misadventures my country has engaged in both within and without its borders. If you look at these 90s television shows, everything is a conspiracy, everything is a mystery. The climate of mystery and backroom government deals, these shady figures, this stuff that the 90s capitalized on has pretty much come to life. It's no longer far-fetched to think about things like Uh, using movies as propaganda because, well, A, we've been doing it since the fucking 1950s, and B, it's quite obvious when we have a propaganda film anymore. We now, we we did, we, meaning middle-class white people, that's horrible, I should not equate we with just that, but the stereotypical demographic that these shows are aimed at lost its innocence and has been trying desperately to shove itself right back into that Eden ever since. The only difference now is that these conspiracies, these theories, have really come to life. And we realize, again with the we, I'm sorry, you have to forgive me, that this is not a grand organized conspiracy. There is no smoking man. There is no Bob to blame. It's not organized so much as it's a clown car driven by imbeciles and bigots. Now that was very cleansing for me to say, so let me just pause a moment and sip my tea. I'll let that sink in for you. Mm. Oh, God, I needed that. Okay. It's this innocence of the 1990s, as symbolized by its FBI agents, that fascinates me to no end. These were the last of the quote-unquote good guys in pop culture. Look at Dale Cooper, for instance. This is a breakfast cereal of a man, okay? It sounds weird, but you you can't argue with me. He's like a Cheerio, okay? (laughs) God help me. So Lynch and company purposely made him very masculine, but also very kind and gentle. Not neutered or whatever, He's very well-rounded, but he's so cheerful and so nice, he's practically wearing a white hat. You could not have a Dale Cooper today. It would not happen. It's it's no mas. We do not trust our G-men, <laughs> or whatever equivalent. We just don't trust our lawmen that much. Not anymore. It would be distasteful to go back there. But even though I just picked on poor Coop, It's not these characters in particular that I want to go into. I want to go into what they're symbolizing. So I've done a little research, a little casual research on Google, and I've isolated these symbolic meanings that I want to touch on, the ones that interest me the most. There's there's others, there's plenty more to say about all this, but like I said, podcasts, not miniseries. So my thesis, as it were, is that we're going to be looking at the three topics that I want to within the realm of fictional G persons, fictional FBI agents. One, paranoia. Then we're going to look at desire. And then finally, we're going to end on a high note with the figure of the female FBI agent because uh, femdom, duh, okay? So (laughs) this is getting ridiculous, but it's fun.
Okay, so Paranoia and the Agent. We're going to start off with a quote from the following book, titled Deny All Knowledge, Reading the X-Files, edited by David Lavery, Angela Haig, and Maria Cartwright. All these are going to be linked in an entry that I'll post later on my website, so you can track back, have a peek, see if you want to buy them, what have you. So to the quote, what had previously been concern turned to preoccupation, a ruling passion. The FBI became the thin, dark-suited line between God-fearing democracy and godless communism. As politicians and press alike began to promote fear of the red menace creeping across our country, the popularly constructed special agent was perfectly positioned to stand and do battle. Now, that, of course, touches on the 1950s, the, well, the ostensible Cold War era, even though it sure as, sure as hell didn't stop there. And I want to talk about the 90s, so Ms. Stark, why this quote? Why are you citing this? I wanted to give you a sense of the roots of this paranoia from which our three favorite agents, well, my two favorite agents and Mulder, were born. So this author posits that in the 50s, pop culture represented the FBI as basically our guard against an encroaching threat. Not our military so much, definitely not the church as much. It was the FBI, the thin, dark-suited line. Now, I'm having a little trouble thinking of a similar institution used in this way before, because throughout the span of American history, any time we wanted to feel protected from invaders, imagined or otherwise, we usually turn to the military, because we are a very, very militarized society. But an FBI agent, especially as represented in pop culture, they're a desk jockey. That's a little weird, isn't it? They're not generally known for being rough and tumble, although in our pop culture we sure do have them do that. I mean, we can look at all the scraps in the X-Files, you know. Um, it's not unheard of, but they're very, very middle class looking. This doesn't fit in with the macho stereotypes of post-war America. Pardon me, tea time again. <clears throat> So let me say this about that. The constructed paranoia that was pushed in the US at that time, you know, via McCarthyism, etc., um, that was a precursor for the paranoia we have now, where instead of, you know, thinking communists are around every corner, we have jackasses in our country thinking that, you know, Central casting has sent terrorists number four to go jihad on their asses. This is not freaking happening <laughs> this way, but people, great numbers of Americans are still very scared of it. It's a ridiculous, bigoted fear, but it is a fear and it is there. Now, in the 90s, however, this was really before we had a lot of this anti-Muslim propaganda. We were in this brief period between communists and terrorists. What could we be afraid of? We're American. we got to be afraid of something, right? Um, God, that's a depressing sentence I just threw off like that. <laughs> Cheapers. So we invented things to be afraid of. And when we invented those fears, aliens, conspiracies, yada, yada, we also invented someone to fix them. The need for someone in command is so powerful in American culture that we have constructed no shortage of daddies. Okay? Yes, I said it. Daddies. The G-Man is certainly one of these. He, and at least until the era I'm really talking about, semi-democratized this figure. It was almost always a he. Actually, it was always a he. We had a classically masculine, cis white man, usually dark hair, pronounced draw, and with his basically sort of bland good looks, 
He was good looking enough to be heroic, but you wouldn't really say hunk necessarily. We're talking burly soldier. Remember what I said earlier about desk jockeys? So, also, too, think the characteristic suit. The suit of clothes, the expensive, well kept suit, really hides a lot of markers of personality. It becomes very anonymous. The suit and trench coat combination is very classic. And what does it make you look like, an FBI agent? Even though I don't think real ones wear that. So with his characteristic clothing, he was reassuringly middle class, the G-Man. But he really could also literally punch out the bad guys. So (laughs) we had a very interesting combination of physical prowess, of masculine strength, but also a restraint. Now consider this aesthetic. This lives on in none other than my coop. So Kyle MacLachlan, who is still, oh, so tasty, very sexy. But when he was young, you gave him enough hair gel, put him in those clothes, he basically turned into a Norman Rockwell picture. He, it's, it's just, it was his look. He couldn't help it. <laughs> so his Cooper was otherworldly, but it, very endearing. And even though Coop was a little... He still fulfilled the formula. White, cis, prominent jaw, serious eyes, very well dressed. He's spooky, but he's still a man's man. And, you know, to be perfectly frank, that would be Harry's man, but that's beside the point. Now, here in the States, since we're a very pugilistic, paranoid nation, we like a quote-unquote manly man. So while Cooper is actually a decent role model of a non-toxic masculinity, a shallow read of the character, if you want to do that, can really allow you to lump him in with the rest of the stereotype. If you get scared, if someone's coming after you, you would want a Coop protecting you. (laughs) He's fairly good at that, unless you're Annie. (laughs) Things get a little shaky if you're Annie. Um... There's probably nothing more white and middle-class American than that precise desire. A man with a badge, and excuse me, a white man with a badge and a gun looking out for you. So, (laughs) I'm going to let that one sink in too. Now, despite our roiling populism and all our current blowhards in this era, and even before that, despite all this American exceptionalism and all that, we sure do like having the hand of the state at our backs. Again, they're the daddy figure. You know, um, we want that hand to be part of the federal government. Whether people admit it or not, they like the thought of this all-powerful entity looking out for them. It's comforting. And I know people rail against it. The individuals, of course, can agree or disagree with it. But as a culture, we like having that in our corner. Now, once upon a time, that hand at our backs was reassuring us that it would beat up fascists. That was pre-war. Yes, we were worried once about fascism. I think this is something we need to take up again. But let me continue. After that, after that was quote-unquote taken care of, what was our next boogeyman? What else do we need Daddy to protect us from? What were we paranoid about? Communism. Go forward into the future more. Like I said, now it's terrorists. But for that space in the 90s, it was aliens. It was supernatural things. It was ill-defined conspiracies refracted endlessly upon each other of, you know, men in suits in back rooms doing dastardly, unspoken things to the American populace. And that all stood in for the last few bubbles from the Soviet cauldron, as well as the rising realization that uh, we have really just tons of pig-headed career politicians obsessed with profit over people. So anytime you see 
the smoking man, for instance, you know, doing something evil, practically twiddling his mustache, even though he didn't have one. There you go. In popular parlance, that's the very nightmare of a Washington politician. Someone who cares far more about power and gain than he does about protecting the people he's supposed to protect. And, th and look at the, um, in X-Files especially, look at how these conspiracies were played out. Alien invaders, of course, but mind control, viruses. There's really no end to these insidious, subtle, biochemical things going on. I mean, I prefer the Monster of the Week episodes, personally, the standalones. So normally I just sort of gloss over the big alien arcs because, you know, Mulder got a mold. But if you look at even some of these Monster of the Week ones that tie into the larger arcs, the paranoia that your mind is going to be taken over from you, that you are going to... <sighs> You're going to become invaded. Not just your country is invaded, but your very skull itself. You will no longer be you. The complete breakdown of identity brought on by an extremely powerful, amorphous, in insanely funded and technologically advanced species. That will worry you. Okay? <laughs> That that will uh, that'll stick with you. And what more do we want than someone charging in with the badge, the gun, and the fists? And now, of course, let's pick on David Duchovny. Again, we have the same physical pattern. He, in fact, he's even closer to the manly man look than Kyle MacLachlan. Well, at least he was back then. Um, this is something that the U.S absolutely loves. <laughs> that sounds a little shallow here, but I'm not sure how else I could say it other than repeating myself. So if you fast forward to now, after Agent Mulder, you know, battles mightily against mind control, viruses, cover-ups, and all that, after he is basically the symbol of the hand protecting us from these invaders, from these mental invaders. Fast forward to now. We are still this scared. And in fact, we are more scared. You would think in the ensuing, what, 20 years uh, that we would have pulled our long pants up a bit, but no, we haven't. Look at what we have now. We're not worried about aliens so much, but we have things like security theater that reveals far more about our national psychology than we can admit. Citizen journalists also revealed the depth and breadth of the depth and breadth, excuse me, of the abuse and violence from the hands of our law enforcement. These are just two examples. The shadowy conspiracies, the backroom BS, it's actually real. Not in terms of mind control, but in terms of resource control, in terms of monetary control in terms of controlling access to health care, jobs, anything that you might need to live your life. And honestly, it's probably not anyone in back rooms with the snidely whiplash mustache. It's probably just people being stupid. So the reality is far, far scarier today because now we know there's no giant brain organizing this. There's, at least in pop culture, we have outgrown the alien invaders. There's no intelligence at the wheel. <laughs> There's just bullshit from here on out, Starketeers. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> of course, of course, we want someone to protect us from the looming threat still. So we're going to keep on the topic here. All right, Inara. So... The FBI agent has long occupied the sort of Galahad role, this fearless protector of all that is good. Of course this was propaganda, but it was very effective propaganda because we love these characters. You know, they're very popular. By the time the 90s rolled around, surely we thought, ah, surely we must be more sophisticated than our Cold War counterparts. No, not by much. No. Mulder endlessly tilted at his windmills, clamored for the truth to be known. 
Scully used all her skills to solve cases, to connect with families, you know. They were doing, at least, you know, in this series, because I'm picking on the X-Files right now, they were fulfilling all the scripts of the decent, upstanding, even patriotic FBI agent standing up to the latest looming threat. They, in the pop culture sense, in the abstracted sense, they had our backs. We were still looking for the comfort of the strong and capable agent, even though the Reds had long since climbed out from under the bed. So, we're going to keep moving on, moving forward. Since I just mentioned want and need so many times in only about 25 minutes, it's high time I talk about desire now. And we're going to have another quote. And this is again from Deny All Knowledge. And see if I actually made a note of the author. That would be Malach, M-A-L-A-C-H. So this is a bit of a multi-part quote here. I'll just read you my highlights. The most obvious similarity between Twin Peaks and the X-Files, however, has to be their FBI agent protagonists. In both programs, FBI agents, who are supposed to be federal cultural boundary police, who occupy positions as arbiters of normalcy, behave in ways that do not always fit with the usual idea. And she goes on to quote another scholar that says, Television government agents are the sin qua non of television's endless and obsessive restorations of limits and barriers that authorize only the most domesticated form of desire. Malak continues, pop culture FBI agents typically function to police character and narrative boundaries, thereby reigning in desire. So what does Mistress want to point out here? What am I saying with regards to desire and the figure of the FBI agent? Look at the phrase I picked out. This, I actually highlighted it. Federal Cultural Boundary Police. They pol uh, police character and narrative boundaries, thereby re reigning in desire. Okay, let's pick this apart. What desires are we so eager to circumscribe that we will eat up this control even in fantasy? Malak says, he or she, the special agent, represents cultural categories of correctness acting out what it means to be normal. Now, of course she skips over Coop because there's really not much that's very normal about my queer little muffin. So she's concentrating on Mulder and Scully, the most sort of cis and heteronormative of the bunch. But this desire, she doesn't really mention in the essay what this desire is is this sexual is this spiritual is it what is desire so when academics talk about desire nine times out of ten they mean sex but since the author doesn't really define it i'm just going to play pin the tail on the theory and let's see where we end up so there is certainly sexuality in the x-files but the boundaries that Mulder and Scully, and I'm just going to go with them, uh, the boundaries that Mulder and Scully enforce are not really sexual. They rail against many things. They try to make the buck stop with them. What do they rail against? Government conspiracies, bureaucratic evil, leading to things like environmental disasters, violence, madness, murder. And of course, in Mulder's case, his greatest desire is for, okay, all together now, the truth. The truth about what? <laughs> we need to keep digging here. Simple transparency about shady dealings is what he wants. Tell us everything about the alien invaders and the Cold War backgammon that threatens the very fabric of American society. And for heaven's sake, please tell him where his sister is. Or where Scully is, depending on the episode. Mulder is convinced the man is withholding something about everything, and that's what he wants to stop. That is the principal desire of the X-Files. It's in the goddamn tagline. The truth is out there. It desires transparency. 
Now, on the surface, this seems to be a countercultural desire, and indeed, it may well be. However, Mulder is this sort of romantic, lone voice in the wilderness, railing against comfortable corruption and petty myopia. Now, yes, on one hand, very countercultural, but on the other hand, doesn't America sort of have a love affair with that mythic figure? Don't we like, on some level, we, whoever we is, our pop culture kind of likes the one guy bucking the system? That comes up a lot. It's been coming up a lot since John the Baptist, you know, so we're going to keep going there. What, or rather, where would we be as a country in the pop culture sense? Where would our media be without our lone dissenters? Where would we be without that figure constructed that is somehow so smart and so prescient that he's able to discern and uphold the truth, sort of like a candle on a fog of lies. We eat this up as a nation. We really, really do. It's, it's in our superheroes. It's in our special agents. And if you go back far enough, it would have been in our saint books. So the message at this point in the century, um, at, by the time we got to the 90s, it was this culmination of decades of propaganda and its digestion in the American tract. Forces larger than any of us, these forces are at work to ruin our lives. We cannot see them and the untold resources that are invested in their functioning, but they are there and we are part of them. We are very small parts of a very large machine. And we need to know about it. Remember, as we came out of the 90s, as we came into the early 2000s, we had pop culture touchstones like The Matrix, where you literally take a pill to open your eyes to the conspiracy. This is not all too far-fetched. This is not just Stark got a Stark, okay? So that was a hell of a time. We have this desire for truth. That is the desire that's motivating the FBI agents. Not just truth for its own sake, but the American people. That's always the spoken and sometimes unspoken corollary to this need for truth. Tell us the truth. Tell the people the truth. So this author, Malak, goes on to describe this rebellious, yet ultimately straight out of the 50s stuff. Although earlier movies, and I'm quoting her again, although earlier movies and even Twin Peaks introduced viewers to new images of the model FBI agent, the X-Files narrative, with its conflicted, complex agent protagonists, its conspiratorial, inhumane organizational, st organizational structure, pardon me, and its fluid boundaries represents the epitome of the newest model of the special agent and FBI story. So we upgrade it. And in my notes here, in my Evernote, I have a little screen cap of that page, and I highlighted conspiratorial inhumane structure, and of course, newest model special agent. The truth, justice, and in the American way, the Superman-like FBI agent of the 50s and 60s, he had been modernized by the time we got to the 90s to fit at what, at the time, was the new need for much more complex, much more newest, nuanced agents and to fit the latest boogeyman, which, of course, was even more ill-defined, these inhumane structures, literally inhumane, given all the aliens the agents this time around, instead of hunting communists, they were hunting structures. You get the idea here. So this is, honestly, this is why I love the X-Files, because even when it's god-awful, and my god, it does get god-awful, it's fun because it's quaint to me. I came of age in the early 2000s. Yes, I know, I'm a baby, whatever, I just turned 32. I would say so sue me, but honestly, you should be paying me because femdom, that's how it works. So I came of age around 
really late 90s, really early 2000s, we had what was in the mix, Columbine, The Matrix, stuff like that, 9-11, you know, I was in high school for this stuff, yes, once upon a time, Mistress was in high school, not dwelling on that, so for me now, as a grown adult in this climate, it's very interesting to look back 10, 20 years, and, uh, it's very quaint for me to see people or evidence of people having wondered if there were shady conspiracies and sort of evil government stuff going on because, you know, backroom deals and black sites and all that. Because, it, yes, it does fucking happen. We know about it now. I hate to sound like I have a tinfoil hat on, but there's a lot of horrible shit going on that now we know about given the way our media has changed so rapidly, even since this period. Remember, the 90s are now quite long ago. It's galling, but it's true. So we have ways of spreading information that we could not have dreamed of back then. So it's interesting for me to go back in time a little bit and see how this figure functioned, how this symbol worked, what needs it fulfilled. You know, it, it assuaged our paranoia. It spoke to our desires as a culture. And now we're going to see a little gender action. We're going to see specifically what the female FBI agent, the, the new kid on the block at this point in U.S. culture, we're going to see what she means. So yet another quote. And this one is a cute title, Hard Boiled and High Heeled. The Woman Detective in Popular Culture by Linda Mizijewski. I'm sure I murdered that pronunciation. Do bear with me. Told you I wasn't feeling well. Here we go. In this early 90s constellation of The Silence of the Lambs, The X-Files, and Cornwell, we can trace a story and character that captured the cultural imagination. The hook of this story is a body switch. Dot, dot, dot. It is a macabre metaphor about professional women, women as authorities, women in places as macho and prestigious as the FBI. Dot, dot, dot again. The characters Scully, Starling, and Scarpetta, that would be from Patricia Cornwell's novels that came out around this time, with their FBI associations are not useful measures of social change, but they are good measures of social fantasy. In this case, a fantasy about the place of women in high-level law enforcement. And my note on this, end quote, my note on this passage was just like sex workers, just like doms. Now, I can only answer for dominatrices, so I'm going to concentrate on us, a little femdom sisterhood going on here. This was very interesting. I did not intend to write about this aspect but it kind of happened as I was taking notes. So here we go. So, okay. Bear with me. I'm going to have to go away from my point to make my point. So think of Scully. Keep her in your head, but also listen to me now. The dominatrix, as she is depicted in pop culture and in the BDSM scene itself, she rides that line between social change and fantasy in a very, very similar way to characters like Scully. So seeing the cliches of our working life, of the Dom's working life, when you see those cliches of like high-heeled boots and the occasional leather flogger on primetime TV, oh, look at us, aren't we naughty, aren't we progressive? It doesn't mean the world is any more fucking accepting of people like me and our jobs, or for the people that I think have a far bigger burden and do it face to face in real time. You know, I'm fucking lucky. I can sit in my house and do this. But there are people that have to meet their clients face to face, and that can be very good, but it is also riskier. So when a television show wants to be naughty or progressive, Maybe it'll give a little hint as to kink, and then we can all pat ourselves on the back for being cosmopolitan and then go back home. 
this does not in any way indicate anyone is fine with the idea of trading sexual services or eroticized services, however you want to parse it. Not necessarily okay with trading these services for money. Just because you see it on TV does not mean the real life analogs are accepted. It simply means that somebody somewhere wants to goose the attention of the vast swaths of viewers who are either vanilla or vanilla by virtue of ignorance. It's marketing. Sorry to say. Just because you f see a femdom doesn't mean it's empowering. I'm sorry, subs. I hate to uh, break that fantasy for you. Just because you... And just like this, just because you see a woman character with a badge and a gun, just like the one in the boots and the whip, it does not mean the barometer of equality is rising. If anything, it could mean it's decreasing because the TV version is a fantasy, and that's all it is. People will accept Scully running around and barking orders, just like they'll accept me purring orders at them, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're in any way prepared to have actual women in real situations of authority that may not be so fun, so sexy, so cute. You know? I mean, who's actually ready to answer to a female boss and not in an eroticized context? Take your sub cap off for a moment and be very, very honest with yourself. You may find you have some baggage there. I'm sorry my voice is getting a little raggedy. But it's true. Just because you're submissive does not mean you are respecting women. Just because you like characters, strong female characters, does not mean you are respecting women. Let that sink into your head, write it down, pin it on the wall. It does not mean I don't like my subs. Generally, I do, and I think mine, I got some good eggs. I really do. My Starketeers, they're good guys. But you have to be honest with yourselves. And for any newbies out there, I want you to do some serious thinking because there's a, a big problem I see in the femdom admirer community of people bowing and scraping to a femdom but not actually respecting her. I will leave that to another podcast. I'm going to return to my point now. So characters like Scully... They are story time for some of us. They are fantasy time for some of us that want to see better representation. For me, who was a nerdy, misunderstood girl, I know, Kel Surprise, right? This was very this was very pleasing for me to see because you had a female character who did not sacrifice femininity. She did not sacrifice toughness. And of course, I mean, you know, most of that magic was Gillian Anderson just not giving a fuck about anything, so they really chose the right actor for this. So this was and still is fantasy fun time for me, because I'm still often very dissatisfied with female characters in popular culture. I didn't really get happy until Mad Max, at least with the stuff from my own generation. Mad Max and then Star Wars Force Awakens because I'm very, very picky about my quote-unquote strong female characters. So we're going to go back to this sort of parallel I was drawing between the femdom and the female FBI agent. Because Scully is story time, basically. Likewise, these, these characters, female FBI agents, they are story time for people with latent submissiveness or fetishism as well. And these people might, might like to imagine being the target of aggressive, powerful women, just like the viewer of straight porn, quote-unquote straight, likes to imagine being the sole focus of horny cheerleaders or nurses. I'm not saying all of you are watching the X-Files one-handed. And I'm not even saying it's a bad thing to lust over an actor. Good God, I do it all the time. Look at my Twitter feed. But look carefully. Are all your strong female characters wank material? Are they? Mistress knows. Just as women's anger is eroticized, so is women's power. 
And this is the essence of both the special agent and the dominatrix. Now here, I'm biting the hand that feeds me. I'm speaking very strongly about the politics of BDSM and power exchange. And I may piss off some of you. I may rattle your cages. But I know you like it. And if you can't handle this, then you can't handle me, dear. Now, people love Scully for various reasons. But all these reasons do is really indicate the social fantasy, like Ms. Juski says. Now, this is only one branch of my fascination with these shows. Of course, yes, yes, yes. I, I draw that parallel between the special age, female special agent and the femdom. And of course, I crush on Jillian Anderson. I like well-rounded female characters, but I identify a lot with her character because, because her character was eroticized so heavily. Now, if you happen to be a little bit younger than Mistress, this might be God help me before your time. But Gillian Anderson was quite the thing for a long time in pop culture. And, you know, she was complicit with this, as far as I recall. You know, she posed for saucy photos and everything. Um, so it's not like I'm faulting her at all. No, I'm not indicating that. In fact, that is what I do for a living. I eroticize my presence. You know, this podcast notwithstanding, usually my voice is very sexy and I... I'm seductive, powerful, etc., and all that. And yes, I, I am a dom. This is what I do. I am a willing participant in my own eroticization, however you say it. I produce content using all these skills, the charm, the wit, the personality. And I seduce people. And it works. You're already probably falling for it. This is my power. But I do understand completely that the lines of who is really in charge are not always clear. So if you were to look to the other side of this parallel, look at a character like Scully, you might think, ah, yes, she is a strong female character. Look at her with a gun being sexy. Who's really being empowered by this? Not always clear. Ah, look, there's Mistress with her headset on talking into the computer, being sexy. Who's really in power here? Hmm? So, let me explain myself. I am the dominant. I am in control. And I am always in control. But if you look at an average submissive fantasy that I might get on any given day, it will be from a man, 25 to 55 years old, he will email me out of the blue asking to be dominated. He has maybe read my listings, probably mostly just looked at the shiniest parts of them. He has long had fantasies of powerful women. He wants someone to be in charge. He wants to be made to do things. So what do I do with him? Hmm. He has a fully formed world of fantasy inside his own head. And I am a complete stranger. He may feel like he knows me from reading and enjoying my content, but I don't know that. Not yet, anyway. If I'm lucky, I'll be able to form a connection with him. And I can pry details out of him. And a lovely call or some form of transaction will result. And usually, we end up forming a good working relationship because I have a great track record of hanging on to callers. I think you all fall in love with me a little bit. And that's okay. That's fine. But let us return to analyzing this. There are a thousand and one variations on this fantasy. And there are many sources of the desire to be submissive. But for every one of you good eggs, you five-star callers, there are assholes that try to top from the bottom. They may not even realize it, but they indulge themselves in their world using my creation as a tool to fap to, basically, which is, of course, what I do. So they indulge themselves, but they don't consider me as an individual. 
especially the ones that don't read the listings. They find me interchangeable with other mistresses. And I know some of you do that. We take note. They take what they want, some of these fellows. They take what they want, and even if I'm quote-unquote shoving it in one or more of their holes, they take, they get, and they leave until they once more need a fix. They swoon at my power and my control, but they only press the button when they feel the need, when their cock is hard. And then once it's no longer hard, I don't exist. So this, this, what does this mean in terms of my actual point here? Your strong female character, she's there. You push the button, you fulfill your fantasy. It's done. You get the tropes you want. You pay for what you want, and you get it. But you may not be able to handle the reality, which is why the quote-unquote strong female character is very often put in a sort of a gilded cage of sexiness, because that's easy to commodify. That's It, it goes down easy. <clears throat> Having an actual, complex, actually human female character is still way too challenging for most viewers. It's still way too challenging for most submissives, <laughs> okay? So, I mean... <sighs> it's a two-sided coin, it really is, you know? I mean, we can't demand everything from our pornography and we certainly can't demand everything from our pop culture but both of them both of these modes mediums media whatever are wish fulfillment services so could they do better hell yes but we can expect a character or a phone dom to be absolutely everything at all times not without confronting the uncomfortable realization that we might have taken this female ideal for granted. So let me draw this in now, because this, this has gone on long enough. So the female agent and the dominatrix, they both play with that fantasy of women in charge, but it's always on someone else's terms, not always on our own. And I want you to chew on that, because this thing, I just saw my little ticker in Audacity reach 53 minutes. This is long enough for you to be listening to my creaky voice tonight. So I'm going to wrap this up. We talked about paranoia, how badly we want a daddy to protect us, the special agent. We talked about desire. What does our desire mean when it has a special agent trying to attain it? I could probably phrase that better, but do bear with. And finally, we had this figure of the female special agent. What does she mean? What does she do? What can she tell us? So I want you to go ahead, and if it's nighttime when you hear this, I want you to close your damn browser and get some sleep, because you probably have work in the morning. And if it's daytime, well, in that case, I want you to cruise by my website, and see the resources that I've linked. Also, don't forget my listings on Night Flirt. There's plenty, plenty, plenty more where this came from. So I'm going to let you consider all of this and invite you to respond, if you'd like, if you already follow me on social media. If you want to have a reasoned discussion, by all means do, feel free. If you want to act an ass, I will block you, though. But I don't think I have to worry too much about that. So this right here is Mr. Sonara Stark signing off for the night. Take care and have a good one. Bye. This podcast has been made possible with the help of perverts like you.